It is a different way of working. And that's, talk about framing, that's a reframe of, of how you go about your work. And I still have to override decades of writing it all down first. Why did I become an executive coach? I saw lots of great people fail to get ahead at work, while their much less talented peers blew right past them. That made me furious, but also curious. What were great people getting wrong? It came down to helping them re-examine what drove success and then helping them make critical shifts one hard truth at a time. Feel like you're doing everything you were told but you're not moving ahead at work nor having the impact you seek? Then welcome to 97% Effective with Michael Winderoth, where we skip feel-good, happy talk and engage experts in pointed conversations about what it really takes to move the needle at work and your career. So if you feel stalled or frustrated or seek that extra edge as you move to the next level, then look no further. This is the Hard Truths Playbook you never got. Hi, I'm Michael Wenderoth, and you're listening to 97% Effective. In my previous episode, I sat down with Liz Bonza, visual storytelling and communication expert at Resource Media, a leading nonprofit communications firm working exclusively in support of social change. Liz and I talked about why words will only get you so far, and why and how to dial in your communication by using visuals. So you cut through the noise and get your audience to take action. In that episode, we discussed and went into depth with examples, three keys to making an impact with visual communication. Number one, we are visual first. Number two, decisions are made in the brain's emotional region. And third, stoke the right emotions with the right pictures. In this continuation episode, Liz shares the biggest mistake her clients make, where not to go with your visual communications, how to test, and an exercise you can do on a regular basis to make sure visual storytelling stays top of mind and becomes part of your communications and leadership toolkit. Enjoy. So Liz, to cut right to the chase, is there one huge mistake or pitfall that many clients fall into when it comes to visual communication? Yeah, yeah. On the topic of ad executives, there's so many lessons to be learned there. What they do for any campaign, you ask any ad executive out there, and we could talk about cars, right? Like Volvo. Volvo's key value they want to communicate is safety. And so what they are doing is thinking of what is the visual that will communicate what is very unique about our brand, SUVs, the value that they want consumers to have is you buy an SUV, you buy yourself freedom. You're just toiling away in your skyscraper or your living room, you know, you're zooming from home and you just want to get away. Independence for American audiences, you know, those are core values. So a visual communication to get me bought into your idea of go out and buy an SUV and you'll buy yourself freedom and independence. I'm going to set the frame first by showing a visual of some SUV in the wilderness, not in, not in the city. That's, that's how they've sold most of their SUVs. So the biggest mistake is in presentations, sweating over your words, and then at the end, just spending, oh my gosh, I have five minutes. I'm going to go on the internet and illegally download a photo (laughs) and just slap it on. And you really want to set the tone first with the first thing people are going to consume, your visual. This is a really important point. It seems like a different way of working. It's flipping that around and spending much more time on what the visual is. It is a different way of working. And that's, talk about framing, that's a reframe of of how you go about your work. And I still have to override decades of writing it all down first and then say it's a report. I have to submit, you know, progress on X project. 
And I'm like, oh, there's so much text here. We'll throw in some visuals of our results um, and we'll pepper it, break up the text. But it's really figuring out people are going to skim and they're going to scan and they're going to process those visuals first. And Michael, there is super interesting data on this with websites, for example. You can have a, it's called a heat map. And the idea is that when companies invest in a big overhaul of their website or they're creating a new product, a new startup, and they're creating their first website and they want to see how people navigate the website and they're constantly making those adjustments to the website. A heat map is where you have this eye tracking software to see where people are spending the most amount of your time to understand what is the user experience and are they actually going to the right places that you want them to? And what they find is that people first go to the visual and so you have the heat map is just this red blob of where they're landing on a website. The longer their eyes spend on a visual, the more likely they're going to read the text around it. And if a photo looks like a stock photo, like a really generic photo, it it just doesn't have any meaning to it. Our eyes, our brains can really, they're amazing. Our brains are amazing. We can intuit a genuine image against a stock image. We'll spend more time on a genuine, authentic image than on something that's just The happy woman in the call center, eager to take your calls. You're like, I know that woman's not happy (laughs) in her job. (laughs) And then you breeze past it. That that is fascinating research. Again, evidence that that shows we are attracted to visuals. Certain visuals will stoke particular reactions. And, And we see this now across social media. Enragement is the new engagement. Imagine this comes up very much in working for social causes. It would be very simple to show very graphic, yeah. enraging images. Could you speak to where you are treading on thin ice or a simple no-go area yeah. From, yeah. from your perspective? Well, let's first talk about why enragement is the new engagement and what's dangerous and unethical about that. So Jonah Berger, have you heard the book about the book Contagious? From Yes, yeah. yes, in fact. So this yeah. is a great so. book, and I love the study upon which this whole premise was you know, founded. Everybody wants to know, make me a viral video. How do you make a viral video? How do you make some idea go viral, right? Like that it catches, contagious, right? And so they looked at a couple years worth of the New York Times most emailed articles. And that was their concept of virality is these are articles that you or I would go on the New York Times website and we'd read it and then we would share it. And they have that clear data of which are the most shared. And they wanted to know, is there, if you look at these hundreds of thousands of articles, is there anything connecting what gets shared? So thinking about engagement and sharing. And what they found was those articles that were shared the most provoked active emotions. So when you say enragement, it is that articles that made people angry, they shared more. Articles that made people really inspired and excited, like something very active or were hilarious, made people share. Articles that had neutral emotions, like just plain old contentment, very disempowering emotions like sadness. People don't go share sad (laughs) articles with each other. Ethics, then your question about the no-go, there are very clear ethical rules. It is what in development circles they'll call uh, poverty porn, or they'll call it sort of flies in the eyes photos. And that is that you should not make people angry about a topic, a problem, or a challenge. You are trying to solve by showing people 
at their worst. That's the idea of the flies in the eyes, to show people at their lowest. You're using somebody else's tragedy for your profit, for your advancement. And so one campaign we worked on recently, it's a fluoridation campaign, we're working on that in Washington and Oregon, and places where people are low income, some of them may live in rural areas where there's no fluoridation, no public fluoridation in their water. If they are low income, they may also not have access to dental care. And those two are a terrible combination in terms of children having cavities. And what we didn't want to show in this campaign for fluoridation is children with cavities. And so instead, our campaign was, again, going back to the emotional payoff, right? It is show people at their best. If there is fluoridation, look at this kid with this beautiful, engaging smile. This is what you get if you support X. Clearly, there is a code of ethics in terms of many of the organizations you work for. And you staked a a, a very moral high ground there. But I I want to challenge you on this because a lot of what is out there, including many of our leaders, are very much using enragement to foster engagement. It is working. It is getting them into seats of power. And not to say that you need to use the same techniques, but if it's very effective, you're not playing the same game. They're playing with another tool that seems to be highly effective. Is that cause much thought on the side of organizations that have staked certain rules about how they present? That That is a tricky rabbit hole where it, people can say, do the right thing and we will do the right thing. Maybe believe in karma, right? Like that is going to come back to haunt you. And I have watched what is acceptable today, whether that is 1995 or it is 2005, 2015, 2020, what was acceptable then a few years later is not. And you are seeing a profound shift in society around what we will tolerate and what is not acceptable. And people are turning on brands Uh, And I think you've seen this with in 2020, right, with the murder of George, George Floyd, is you had brands that wanted to take advantage of sentiment. And for those who are like, it works, it works. Every now and then, it does not work. And your corporate brand gets the full on takedown on social media And if that is not enough of a check, I don't know what is. Like, right, it's brand reputation and the idea that what's acceptable is changing rapidly. A definitely a much deeper topic. Liz, the strategy that we have talked about, we have looked at, talked about it as art. We have talked about a lot of the science and the brain science behind it. Are there any notable differences in terms of how groups react to specific messages between gender cultures, or even, as I think about this, age groups. The newer generation is simply growing up with fast visuals. Do they react differently? Anything that come out of the, you know, the the research or the testing that you guys do that would indicate differences? Yeah, there's a lot of psychology. One thing that is true, universal, no matter gender, age, culture, et cetera, is that if your visual does not match your message, you have cognitive dissonance, no matter what, because it's all brains are the same. So what I mean by that is that if I show a devastating image, but I have a hopeful message, the devastating image is going to stick with people and they'll ignore the hopeful message. And this is, again, the pictorial superiority effect that You set the frame and people cannot hear something else. And I want to ask you, do you remember, so this was at one point dubbed the greatest commercial, it was a PSA of the 20th century. It was the so-called crying Indian uh, anti-littering PSA. It was part of the America the Beautiful campaign. 
you remember that at all? I can describe it. A long time ago, but I think I believe, yeah, yeah I remember. But if you could describe it, it'd be well, great. Well, so there's, there's a book, Robert Saldini's uh, Influence, The Power of Persuasion. Mm. He did some testing on this image. And this image was, we had so much littering in the 70s going into the 80s. Of course, we still do. But it was really bad then. And uh, so there were a lot of public service announcements, and they would show a littered landscape. And then they would have this message, and it would be littering is bad, don't litter, blah, 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 have like a um, bag in your car so you don't throw stuff out the window going down the highway. The research, those commercials had the opposite effect. More people littered. And what happened is the visual was of a littered landscape, and that set a social norm. If the landscape is littered, that's just the way it is. That's how it is. Same thing happened with the anti-smoking PSAs that came a couple decades later. You'd show somebody smoking, smoking, and then you'd have this message of smoking's bad for you. Smoking causes cancer. And all people saw was people smoking. And That's what stuck with them. That's a universal truth that social norm is what you set in the visual use. What you show is what is acceptable. That's how people process it. You've been listening to 97% Effective with your host, executive coach, Michael Winderoff. If this interview is making you think, make sure to share it with a friend. Now, back to our interview. Liz, as you talk through these examples and we talk about the science, there be, may be those out there who, who disagree and say, well, I think this visual would look better. I'm sure you get this with clients all, all the time. And the beauty uh, that we have today is that we can actually test yeah. things. As we were preparing for this, you, you had showed an example from a campaign where you ran multiple iterations. And this is something anyone out there can do now using very simple tools on the internet. Could you just walk us through how, Mm -hmm. when you have various ideas or executions, you actually put them to the test to determine what's going to be most effective? Yeah. Yeah. So the idea here is that it does not cost a lot to test visuals. And what I think is going to resonate with another person, my gut instincts, not always right. And I have been proven wrong so many times. And the idea is you take a segment of the audience you're trying to communicate with and you test visuals and and the verbal message, whether it's text or whatever. And in classic experiment fashion, with what's called A-B testing is that you only change one variable between Mm. two things so that you know that's the variable that works or doesn't work. And you can do that on Facebook. You can do it on YouTube. Classic example from my work experience of learning, oh, hadn't thought of that, (laughs) was a, a big environmental group rolling out a brand new website and you've got a picture they had wall street donors and they had what we would call the dark green right the dark green is the hardcore activists they asked them to do something call congress write a letter here there everywhere they will do it if prompted by this group and uh they rolled out their website and they had you know, a segment of the Wall Street audience, and they were doing in-person focus groups, getting people's reactions. And they showed these polluting smokestacks. Now, these corporates, they made their money (laughs) off polluting industries. And they said, that is so anti-business. I don't like it. It's not why I give to your group. And they were like, wait, what? (laughs) We're trying to make clean air, clean water. I thought this was, and they were like, show me the beautiful landscapes you used to have on your old website. That's why I give to you is because I want to know these protected areas. Then they go to their activist base and they're showing those polluting landscapes. And those people are like, yeah, where can I send my letter? (laughs) And, And they realized different images 
uh, resonate with very different audiences and beauty of a website, right, is there are many side right. doors and their donation page is going to have, here's the end result. Their take action pull down tab is going to have, here's the horrible things that are happening somewhere, somewhere in America. And they would not have known that if they did not test with specific audiences. So yeah. this is great data you can get from Google. And, and Liz, as you were talking through that example, I pulled up a visual here of a, of a campaign that you guys ran in terms yeah. of solar, solar panels, mm -hmm. creating awareness around installing or, or putting them in, in your residential areas. Yeah. And could you just tell us, there was three different visuals, same, like you said, holding constant the you know, call to action, so to speak, yeah. in these three pictures. And then you tested them on presumably Facebook yeah, here, to look Facebook. at what was getting the, the reactions. Can you just talk about what was the takeaway here or the insight from doing this? Yes, yeah, what they, what they see matters. We thought about reasons for people to go for solar energy, and one is that um, there's a, the phrase called green, green jobs. This is producing jobs, new jobs, and then another one was this argument that trying to reach conservative audiences who hold the military in very high regard, that the military is using solar everywhere. And if they're using it, we should too. And then the other area was everybody loves farms. Everybody loves farming and farmers are putting panels on their farmland to augment their income to survive. And we found the farm, using the image of the farm, and they kind of had the, the rancher hat and clear rural background, that was the one that worked the most with our target audiences. And so you still had same text on the Facebook ad, but we just swapped out the image so we could really see which is the image that was getting the most click-throughs. Mm. So you were laser focused on who your end user was that you were Correct. speaking to or getting them and the action you wanted them to do was to go and click to through, complete a click survey. survey. Yep. Yep. Liz, as we circle back to one of the things you said at the beginning, very much all the principles here seem mm -hmm. applicable to presenting internally, presenting on PowerPoint. Is the takeaway simply think about that audience, that they're emotional, and to think first of what visuals you may be using to help drive home the message? Yeah. We have a phrase. It is not a pretty phrase, but with PowerPoint specifically, because you're just hearing, I'm an, I'm an advocate of PowerPoints because it's a tool you can use in presenting either to your boss or to whoever. Just consider PowerPoint your visual. Bullets kill. <laughs> and that is a terrible phrase uh, to use, but I am speaking strictly to a PowerPoint presentation, and we have all been in that room. The lights dim, you look at the PowerPoint, you see all that text, and you're toast. It's two in the afternoon, you had a heavy lunch. If we're going to remember that we are visual first and we are verbal second, if I see a PowerPoint, with a lot of text on it. I'm gonna tune you out, Michael, because I can only, I can't hear and read at the same time, but you have just offered me a visual and so I'm gonna read it and I'm gonna tune you out so I can read that. If it's a visual, right, I said you process that visual 60 times faster than words. I don't have to tune you out when I see that, that visual. So that's the thing I would just, Ask people to remember with your presentations. It's another reason to use uh, visuals is we can't process words on a slide at the same time as hearing words verbally. Liz, any question I didn't ask or ground we didn't cover that you would like to call out here as we get to the end? Ah, okay. That's the big final question. I, I will say that next time say you're in a doctor's office or you're walking through the airport and you see kind of the ad boards on the side and you see 
let's say it's a visual, a beautiful visual of nature, think about how that makes you feel. This is just kind of an exercise. Go out in the world. Next time you see a calendar with beautiful images, say it's the Nature Conservancy, know that there are people behind that choice of an image. Somebody who created that knows that awe, like natural vistas produce an emotion of awe. They know that emotion has the effect of calming people down and settling their systems. Wonder why it's in the airport. People are stressed and harried. There are people that understand the psychology behind visuals and everything that you see that is producing an emotion inside you. And it's, it's a great thing to think about what they're trying to do there and take lessons for your own communications. Excellent exercise. And it goes to this point about thinking as individuals, we have choice, choice in terms of thinking about how we present. And if you take many of the strategies that you've outlined here, you're going to be much more strategic and deliberate and presumably get to your goal faster. So Liz, how do people reach you, resource media, the resources that you have talked about or we have alluded to here in our discussion? There, well, I have discovered on the internet there are two resource medias. We are the .org, not the .com. <laughs> You're going to get a whole different business when you go to .com. Uh, resource recycling. But I am at Resource Media. We're a nonprofit communications firm. We also have Visual Story Lab. And there is lots of research there on using images from eyes looking right at you, follow the gaze. We've got lots of tips there. And then, my goodness, just cue that up in the, on the good old internet and start your own research on neuroscience of decision making. And I warn you, you will go down a rabbit hole. The good thing is you don't need to go down the rabbit hole because your resources distill and pull it together. And I will add here that you guys have been saying this for a long time. So you were way ahead of the curve in terms of talking about the importance of visual storytelling and visual communication. Liz, thank you so much today for joining me. It's been a great conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Michael. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to 97% Effective, where we skip happy talk and help you break through and ascend one hard truth at a time. Help others discover this show. Leave a review and rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you like what you heard, you can get free resources, including the first chapters of Michael's book, Get Promoted, on his website, www.changwinderoth.com. That's www.changwenderoth.com.